So I hope everyone is back and I think we can continue here. Um, we are very happy to have Birgit Niesner today with us. Um, Birgit is our keynote spe speaker of today and she is one famous, successful and important female economist in international economics in Austria. Birgit is director of the economic analysis and research department of the Austrian Central Bank. And before being appointed as director of the economic analysis and research department at the Austrian Central Bank in last year, Birgit uh, holds various positions as economist and researcher with the Erste Group, the Raiffeisen Bank International and the European Investment Bank. She also holds a PhD in economics from the Vienna University of Economics and Business. And besides having the PhD in economics, she has three different master degrees, one in economics from the Vienna University of Economics and Business, one in social anthropology from the University of Vienna, and a master in development studies from the London School of Economics. So um, we are very, happy to have you here today and we are uh, quite curious for, on your um, keynote speech about two steps forwards, one step back. Thank you, Mrs. Meyer. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And thank you for the introduction. And I hope you can see my first um, slide. Yes. Yes. And can you see only one slide or can you see two? Um, we actually see your reference uh, screen, so also the next slide. Okay, then I will um, shortly try to change this. Is it okay now? Yes, thank you. Yes, okay. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's a big um, honor and I regret very much that I um, missed the presentations of um, the young economists. Um, I know um, one that the last presenter at least a little bit and I also must say, Julia, that um, my PhD thesis was close to your topic, but it's 30 years ago. For me, it's a big um, thing um, to have been asked to do the keynote after this new young generation of researchers. And um, as I could be your mother, I, it came to my mind to investigate the question, what has changed? what has changed um, since I was in your shoes and um, does a generation make a difference? And which obstacles um, did I face? Which obstacles will you face? And I would like to start with one fact, which is probably not known to the young ladies. Julia knows it, I know this, but uh, when I was born, it was still a time when women had to ask, when wives had to ask her husband um, for permission if they wanted to take up a job. So in 1975 only, and I'm born in 1971, but in 1975 only, uh, there were major um, legal changes um, to put men and women at equal footings in the family, especially. And um, so you see from the stem period, this is a little bit the spirit of my um, youth, um, that um, there were still um, really things which we cannot imagine right now, which were worth being fought for. And the question now is, what has changed since then? Has it become better? Yes, two steps forward. But also there, I would like to single out a few things which have not changed or which are new and where I have struggled of finding, where I struggle to find out what they mean to you. But maybe we get to this in the discussion. Let me first focus on something which has clearly improved. The role models. I think there are a lot more, lot more role models in economics 
which you can look at, where you can orient yourself to. And I mean the four ladies on the on the right side, for instance. I don't think um, that they that they need to be quoted here, but I'll do shortly, and then I'll ask you whether somebody knows who is the lady on the left side. So on the right side, you can see Janet Yellen, you can see Mrs. Georgieva, Mrs. Georgieva, you can see Christine Lagarde, and you can see Carmen Reinhardt. They represent big bodies. Um, the U.S. Treasury, ECB, IMF, chief economist of the World Bank. So this was unthinkable 30 years ago that those positions were all um, taken by um, brilliant female economists. But if I may ask into the audience, does anybody know um, the, the lady on the left side? She was um, in my youth. She held a very important position in Austria. She's Austrian to help you. Mrs. Meyer, you have to tell me if nobody can turn on the tone or write it in the chat, then I stop asking. But I really would like to know whether the young ladies know this lady. Um, uh, not uh, that young lady who answered, but I see an answer here. It's Maria Schaumeier. But just uh, yeah. to let yeah. you know exactly. that there are answers. Yeah, thank you. That's the right answer. Um, so um, the first governor of the Austrian Central Bank was in his position in 1818. And since 1818, there was one female governor of the Austrian Central Bank, and that was Maria Schaumeier. And coincidentally, she was a governor um, when I was studying at the VU. Um, so yeah, I had one role model when I was studying, I would like to say. So this is something which has clearly changed. Um, one other thing is that those women in power, they use their positions. And you can see that gender is now much more of a mainstream topic than it used to be when when I was studying um, and um, I just um, single out things which really impressed me in the last year, I must say. One is very lovely to listen to, that's the ECB podcast. The ECB podcast is a very nice series anyway. But here you have a conversation of Lagarde, Ursula von der Leyen and Janet Yellen on topics of world politics, but also on um, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on female empowerment, female economic empowerment. So uh, in a very relaxed mood, the three ladies in, 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 in such positions chat among themselves and they discuss um, sorrow things also like the transatlantic cooperation. So it's a very interesting mix between economic and geopolitical topics. On the left side, you see something which also impressed me very much. And again, it would have been unthinkable 30 years ago that we had the first gender money and finance conference at the Austrian Central Bank. I was still not um, in, in, in the Austrian Central Bank. Um, my predecessor this, um, organized this to, together with other people and our governor helped to get um, Mrs. Georgievia and uh, Mrs. Lagarde who were part who were presenting at this conference. Um, it's a very um, interesting uh, mix again on economic topics. I would definitely recommend you and I can list, send a list of links afterwards to have a look at it. And the good news is that tomorrow we have the second gender money and finance conference at the Austrian Central Bank. Um, so you have a um, you have a chance. You see the link below to see how participants discuss issues of digitalization, gender, and the economy. But it's not only important to have these top-down um, approaches, conferences, podcasts, but also to see that there are feminist networks which work bottom-up in economics. And I would like to mention Frau WL which is an economist um, feminist network at the VU in Austria, in Vienna. Um, and they do, do different things. Um, of course, connecting each other is important, but also presenting portraits of economists. And I also must say that um, I, I was part of this as a mentor. Um, and I um, 
some of the things I mentioned today, like the 1975 legal reform, I owe the copyright. Uh, I know I owe the idea to Frau WL, so thank you for this. So this has changed in a positive way. There are more networks, there are more role models, there is more gender topics over the place. What I, from my perspective, see as a negative change is social media. And this is really something um, where I don't envy you. Um, this very broad, negative and dynamic attention, which you can get if you say the wrong things. Um, one um, affair, one, um, one shitstorm which really drew a lot of attention was at the beginning of this year when a young, um, I think, German economist, Isabella Weber, who studies in the US and who is a junior professor, professor in the US, she proposed selective price controls, selective price controls in an environment where um, inflation is higher and higher. And it was a proposal which is not mainstream economics, but was the debate. And um, she really got a lot of very, very adverse um, reactions. And I mean, first of all, she acted against the economic um, establishment. Second, she is a young woman, so it was a little bit too much. And um, I mean, she got also prominent supporters, but in the end, Mr. Krugman, the Nobel Prize winner, he called it a stupid proposal. And Mr. Krugman has 4.6 million followers on Twitter. So it's very powerful when he says this. And she, the young professor, really felt um, the power of social media. Um, Mr. Krugman deleted his tweets 48 hours later and apologized. But I think the damage was done. And I think it shows how things um, in the social media can turn very ugly and very nasty um, in a very short period of time. The other thing is, which I would like to quote um, to, to tell you that the environment is not benign if you use a lot of internet and social media channels and all this. It's a platform um, which comments on the hirings and the job market for economists. Um, which is, you can see the link below. And um, Alice Wu um, did a little research and she found out, um, or she, she, she found out the correlation, which adjectives have the strongest predictive power um, to show whether the post refers to a woman or not. Yeah? And um, the 10 adjectives I'm quoting now, they are not part of good, um, um, English, um, but they say what people, what the other participants think about women um, being mentioned at this platform. So the adjectives are hotter, hot, attractive, pregnant, gorgeous, beautiful, tits, lesbian, bank, and horny. So definitely nothing related to applications as an economist. And this is something which is really like a very, very nasty multiplier and probably very, very hard to combat and to digest. And now I'm coming to something which I which has not changed so much. And this is still the problem of the leaky pipeline. And this is something where now my generation and the young generation still faces the same problem. It probably has improved a little bit. I'm showing you the leaky pipeline of um, the University of Vienna because it is graphically presented in a very clear way. So you have roughly um, one woman and one man um, starting studies. Then um, here you have already more women um, than more men than women at the level of assistants uh, or postdocs. And um, this gets worse until you reach the professor level where you have um, two men for one woman. Um, there are action plans there is a consciousness of this problem, but um, University of Vienna is not the only institution facing this problem. Just to quote the numbers from the VU, the, the gender ratios don't look much better there. So you again, you have a roughly 50-50 starting their studies. So you have a little bit less of women starting at the VU, 48% only. 
and at the professor level, um, it is only a 29% female um, percentage. So here we have a lot um, to do still. And the tricky question is, there are all kinds of action plans I have said. There is consciousness, there is political will to, to change this. But the question is, how do you do it? And I would like to come here to an author and to a book which I really admire and who I think that the, she's um, at Harvard and she's a behavioral economist. And I think that she can or she has contributed a lot to the debate of how to change things because um, many, probably most women and many, many men want to change things and it's not so easy to find out how to do things and what works. And um, I could have um, done my whole keynote only on, on this one book, but I'll try to pick a few findings and introduce them to you, which really impressed me a lot. First of all, there is this discussion about unconscious bias. So we do have um, um, prejudices and assessments and opinions and cliches in our head already before we meet real people. And we all know that this is, um, I mean, it, it, it applies to different social categories, but of course it also applies to men and women. And what is really tricky about probably you all know this, but we as women also have the same um, cliches in our heads. So for instance, if you play this um, simple experiment that you um, give um, evaluating persons um, a lot of CVs and you delete the names um, and then you put the names again, yeah, you still have um, an adverse factor in the assessment of um, the CVs of female candidates, and this and it is and it holds true whether the evaluator is a man or a woman. Um, you get something of a negative bias when the CV is then um, is showing that the name of a woman. So this is one thing um, which we cannot deny which is important to know and where you have to find some work around. Another thing is that um, the success of women does not make them more sympathetic. So there were, and I mean, the nice thing about this behavioral economics approach is that it works on the basis of experiments, that it really has a, a lot of data which it can digest, that it, the experiments are done in different settings, and they are repeated and over the time you see that they always come to the same conclusions. So for instance, if you compare um, um, successful women in what is considered to be a typically male domain, um, then it is like this, that if she is clearly successful, if there is no doubt that her career was a self-made career and she is excellent in what she does, then she is assessed as being not so nice and less sympathetic than the same male persons who have done the same career. And so she can have the same career, but she will, pay, she will pay a price for it by being assessed as a less nice person. If you compare um, two people and it is not a man and a woman, and it is not so clear of how really how solid the success of those two persons is, of the man and the woman, then in this case, in this experiment, most people say, in the case of doubt, it's the guy who is more successful, who is more competent. So um, this kind of, of, of assessing men and women differently is something which you have to acknowledge and you have to try to circumvent. One means, and, and many, many companies use a lot of money on this, is to introduce diversity trainings and to talk about this unconscious bias. There are nice apps where you can train this. Um, to cut, uh, to put it shortly, um, Professor Bonnet comes to the conclusion that they are not effective. And she also shows nice experiments or not so nice experiments where you can see that stereotypes don't disappear only because you have done this training. And she even shows some cases where those stereotypes were reinforced. 
Um, what is also known is that those stereotypes, they are not only guiding our, our thinking, but they have real economic impact on the careers of women. So in countries where the gender stereotyping is especially strong, um, you can see that um, they impede women's careers in um, important economic domains or scientific domains. Um, and then the question is, if you hear all those facts, what to do and what works is, is there is no, and this is the bad news. Um, I mean, the good news is that you can do something. The bad news is um, that it is not an easy recipe. Um, things which are, which have proven successful in experiments is for instance, per perspective taking. Um, this is something which we all know from if we have a, a conflict with somebody is very important that you put yourselves in the shoes of the others. So perspective taking that you really in a in a in a training situation or in a in a you put people with a lot of facts and with a lot of information in the shoes of other people and try to make them act and try to make them think as if they were in this position. So this was something which proven reduced or changed the behavior of participants afterwards. The other things which proved to be successful is that, for instance, you um, play with yourself, um, advocatus diaboli, so you put yourself in a position where you have an opinion and then on purpose, you contest your own opinion. And by doing this, you find more and more arguments of why the position of the other is holding true or may also have some value. And she continues with those kind of methods, which for us, um, um, and they they have to be done in a, in a systematic and coherent way. So it's nothing which you can invent with yourself um, in a group of people Sunday afternoon. So they have to be done in a systematic and coherent way. But there are ways to work around our own cliches. It's not easy. And it has to be done in a professional way, um, but there are things, um, but there are things which work. Um, what is also important is to see and to, to see and to acknowledge that women do behave differently in different situations. For instance, in job interviews and salary negotiations, you have a lot of. Um, good um, evidence that women act differently. They ask for less, they don't negotiate at all. They don't apply for positions if they um, deem themselves to be not super or overqualified, whereas men try to go there and give it a try, even if they only fulfill 70% of the criteria. So those are things, it looks complicated, it is complicated, but the good news comes at the end sometimes, and that's what she advocates, you have, you can solve problems easily um, with very simple changes. Yeah? So the, the things that we're, we're talking about until now, they really happen in our heads. And it's something which we bring with our education, with our society, and which you cannot get rid of easily. But sometimes then you can really trick our brains and trick our per personalities with simple design um, proposals. And the thing I'm mentioning here, and she brings much more in her book, is um, something which probably many of you know already, but it's a very good example of where cheap and easy change can really um, change um, the presentation of men and, uh, of, of women and it was big orchestras in the US in the 80s which already started questioning themselves why was it like this that many more male musicians were successful in the auditions and the simple design idea was to put a curtain there and um, to let women and um, men um, go to the rehearsals and play when they apply for a big orchestra without being seen. So it's called blind auditions. And um, it was, the success was, it really changed things. Um, so it, from this moment on, the percentage of female orchestra musicians was rising strongly in the US. And let me just say one thing, think on this. What I mean with the why it is so important is that it suddenly 
for the big orchestras in the US, it enlarged the talent pool by 100%. Because until then, the success rate of women was negligible because everybody was looking at them and having his own, as I said, biases, unconscious or conscious biases. And with this simple idea, it suddenly enlarged the choice for orchestras to both men and women. And that means that, of course, they had more choice of top musicians um, to be chosen from. So blind auditions, very good example. And it did not stay with the orchestras. Um, it, it continued in big companies and also in, in, in RBI, where I worked before. Anonymous tasks were part of the, of the process to be hired, um, part of the application processes. So it's something um, which is worthful thinking about it and um, which is a good idea how to change design to trick our brains. One other thing, apart from integrating scientific um, evidence and, and thinking about how we think is um, to take the men on board. I think it's really important and here I'm coming to the family and I'm not talking about professional careers, but I think that the whole difficulty in why do female careers um, show this leaky pipeline? Um, why is it so difficult for women to advance is of course related to how um, um, the division of labor looks at home. And um, I'm just um, showing here um, to represent this also very hot and very difficult topic, two things. Um, on the left side, you can see the so-called child penalty. It shows you of by how much income is reduced after having a child. So it's the labor cost, it's the earnings relative to pre-child earnings. And if you see the darker line, it's the women's line and it drops much more. Um, I mean, in most countries, the men's line does not drop. It stays around the same, um, but um, the earnings of women drop drop sharply after having had um, um, a child. But if you look at Austria here, it is one of the worst countries in this respect. It's a little bit, Germany is the same league um, and even Sweden, yeah, there is a strong drop, but then it recovers strongly. In Austria, the picture is very bad because also the recovery of the earnings of women is not very strong. So here we already have um, 10 years after the birth of a child, it's still, yeah, minus 50%. Uh, whereas men, even after the birth of a child, they even earn a little bit more. Um, one measure to fight this and one measure to change this is um, to reserve special times of paternity leave, which can only be taken up um, by fathers. Um, so it's called here, it's an OECD um, statistic, it's called father's leave entitlements. You can see, for instance, the two countries in Asia really go for this measure. It's Korea and Japan. They have 52 and 53 weeks, which can be taken out only by fathers. Um, Austria is somewhere here with nine weeks, so they can be taken only by fathers in addition to, to what, the, what the mother takes, and then it goes down yeah, and, and is not used in many other countries as a measure. I think that this is something very important because it puts men and women on an, e on, on an equal basis and makes, um, them be, um, makes them present in their families and leads to a work-life balance where both can have duties at home and duties in the job. So this is a sort of summing up already. I think um, what I would like to stress in a keynote for young economists is that role models are very, very relevant. You have more than I had. Of course, role models should act in the interest of other women. And so you, you know, maybe you know this, that we also talk about the Thatcher effect. 
it's not good if you have women in, in high positions and then they turn around and they don't care about the pipeline of younger women following. Um, the second lesson learned, which I would like to stress here, is that um, as an economist, it's very important to go for mainstream topics as well, or also for mainstream topics. I would like to quote here um, Margit Schratzenstaller. Um, she said that first she became a tax expert and then she focused on gender issues. And I think it is important because if to build up this knowledge about one domain, to earn the respect of your colleagues, and then as an add-on also to, in, to care about gender issues. That would be my, my recommendation. Third one, and I'll come to this, is if you um, go for a professional um, working environment, university, public sector, private sector, make sure that you know the institutional framework. I'll talk about the institutional framework of the UNB in a second, and that you use it. One more um, lesson learned for me is that networking with other women is very important, but also um, don't exclude men from your perspective. Um, in the last years in RBI, where I was working, um, it was that the successful women also had a male supporter, a male mentor. Um, so I would say for a young woman, it's it has advantages and disadvantages and probably you should mix it and it's very good if you have female role models, but it's also very important to learn from men um, career-wise and um, in, your, in your field of economics. Yeah, using diversity is something which I did not say it until now, but I want to stress it here, is that why, why do we do all this? Why do we think, I mean, first of all, being a woman, you're interested in being represented as a woman. The other thing, as I said before, is by promoting women, you enlarge the talent pool where big universities, big orchestras can choose from. But um, the third reason for promoting women is that if you have a mix of women and men sitting at the table, it does give a different um, culture of discussion. And um, there are also studies which show that companies and other premier that take better decisions if a more um, mixed choir of voices can be heard. And if the backgrounds, the educational and life backgrounds of um, people who lead the discussion are diverse. Um, next point is, and this is taking up the behavioral economics perspective again, I think it is important um, to focus on things which work uh, and to learn from scientific learnings. And as I already said, it is very important to lead this discourse, including and integrating the male perspective and taking them on board, especially in the families, as I have said. Coming to my own institution, the Austrian Central Bank. I would like to share a little bit how the institutional framework looks like here, and it is a great institutional framework, I must say. First of all, I'm looking forward to Women's Day tomorrow. We will um, publish a video on role models again, and at the same time, our, um, our they are called in English Equal Opportunities Officers, you can see them on the right side. Um, they have managed to negotiate within the Austrian Central Bank a new gender action plan, which will also go online. So if you're interested, have a look at the video, have a look at the action plan so you know which are the measures taken here at my institutions. On the right side, you can see the equality opportunities officers. One man is missing on the photo, but this is also very nice that we have a mixed team. Yeah? And I know that one of the ladies, no, I think two of the ladies are present in this in this keynote. So hello to Katya and hello to Julia. Um, the frame for this all is the public sector equality duty. So there is a law which says that public institutions are not allowed to discriminate and they must take action to change imbalances between men and women. I'm stressing this because this is not the case for the private sector. Uh, of course, in the private sector, you also have some minimum standards like, like um, sexual harassment is forbidden, of course. But this kind of proactive action, this kind of action plans, 
I only got to know it now in the Austrian Central Bank and it's a big privilege of the public sector, I must say. We will also go out with recruiting events at universities. We will try to approach young um, economists and we hope that we will get the response from young female um, economists. Um, because what I'm saying in the next sentence is that we are eager to have good women on board. Sometimes the UNB is a little bit like a very big tanker and sometimes maybe not so easy to address from outside. So what I can offer here is that if you have an answer to the institution, if you don't, if you have a question to the institution and you don't get an answer, write an email to me. I will try to put you in touch with the right people. And in addition, what I can say is that um, within my department, the economics department, um, we have we are currently working on a um, big reform. Um, we have given ourselves a new structure and we will soon publish a new research agenda. And um, I also hope that within the next weeks we can publish this on the homepage of the Austrian Central Bank, which is probably very interesting for you as young economists that you find out what are our priority topics and what is the Austrian Central Bank's research focused on. So please um, follow us wherever. I talked about social media in a negative way, but I hope that you um, will use our channels. Um, we, we try to really be open. We have videos, we have, we have um, LinkedIn and all this. And do get in touch with us if you have questions. And I'm now coming to my personal conclusion. And um, yeah, the world is like it is. It is two steps forward, it's one step back. The fight has not stopped. There is a lot of reasons um, for you to, to, to be active in, in the women's promotions field again. But when I, and those are personal conclusions, yeah? So it's, everybody should follow his, his own, her own recommendations. But for me, for instance, it helps you when I have a look at other women who have endured much more. Uh, and probably, you know, a lot of you know the film, but if you don't know the film, or if you think that you want to celebrate Women's Day tomorrow in a very nice way, go and watch the film Hidden Figures. Those three ladies, um, Afro-American ladies, um, were mathematicians, I think in the 50s or 60s at NASA, and they were literal, literally put in the cellar doing calculations for the big um, space missions of NASA. And um, it was an invisible work which they were doing, but they contributed a lot to the success of the big, big missions. And I mean, those women were fighting with problems which we probably all don't know, like, um, yeah, not even having a toilet um, for, for ladies. And, and then coming back to work and being late after having gone to the toilet. So this, and it's, it's a really, it's a wonderful thing. Um, again, for me personally, it means that strengthen your resilience. You need to have a thick skin. I think that um, we will get ahead if we really, um, yeah, if, if we promote our cause, um, and um, for me, it has turned out to be, yeah, not to take everything so serious, not to take things too personal, but really to think that we, we have to fight to get ahead. And the third point for me is also that in the, in the discussions on women's promotions, on equality of gender, um, everybody has an opinion and everybody seems to have experience I'm a little bit sometimes frustrated in those discussions. And for me, it's important to find out what works. That's why I have introduced the book um, by Professor Bonnet. Um, but focus your energy and pick the fight you really want to fight. And also use the chances of the place you're in. Um, you're young, your life will take many turns. Um, but wherever you are, at home, at university, in your work environment, um, use the chances which are given to you and don't think only about you, yourself, but also the networks. And my last sentence for today is that, um, of course, what motivates me as well is that I now have a daughter who is 18 years old and I really would like her not to have the same discussions with her daughter in another generation's in another um, generation's time, 
um, but I hope that things will keep changing and that the leaky pipeline will not look, look the same in 30 years down the road. That's all for me. I, I, I talked longer than I thought and I'm open for questions. I stop sharing, okay? Thank you very much um, for your... You're mute, Mrs. Meyer, or at least I don't hear you. Should be on here. So thank you very much um, for your quite inspiring um, insights and your sharing your own experience with us. Um, so are there any discussions, questions? Please be free. It's a quite important topic you raised. And so thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. Um, if, as long as there's no other questions, I might start uh, to ask you about your personal stance in relation to female quotas also in academia, which is quite often discussed in uh, several institutions. So what's your personal um, stance on that? Um, I must say that I'm, I mean, I know this discussion again from my old company, from RBI. There is a little bit of a discussion in UNB as well. I think the quotas help. I think that um, maybe we are too patient and things go too slowly and they may act like an accelerator. I would like to quote one example of a successful um, quota for me, and that was the one for supervisory boards in Austria, where really the discussion until then, it's a quota of 30%, and until then the discussion is that um, we just don't find the women who are qualified for this kind of supervisory board activity. As soon as the quota was there, the women could be found. And um, for me, it's, it's something which helps. It's not the Wunderwaffe, yeah? It really should um, not, it should be qualitative and quantitative measures should complement each other. And a lot of, that's why I was focusing so much on this unconscious bias things, a lot must change in the heads of men and women, yeah? but it definitely is one of the measures which can help. Yeah, thank you. I would agree in, in, in this respect that it's an important measure, but not the Wunderwaffe, as you said. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you have um, any recommendations on how to kind of overcome the subconscious uh, barriers, um, which you also raised uh, from the nice book you introduced? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing, as I said, she, she proposes several things where you really are training yourself. Um, I did the classical um, diversity trainings and unconscious bias. There is even an app, as I said. Yeah, um, But they do raise your, they do widen your horizon. And obviously, they don't change your behavior very much. Yeah? As soon as you have to take quick decisions, as soon as there is social pressure, as soon as you have to really act, yeah, you go back into old patterns. Yeah? So what I said is that um, you really have to find out with yourself that, um, I mean, it's, it's one thing is making it conscious and the other one is that you really have to step up and work on yourself um, with those methods, for instance, of putting um, counterfactual information of testing yourself with um, avocados diaboli methods, yeah? but it's not so easy. Yeah? So I think it's something where it helps to make yourself aware. And then you really need very good coaches and trainings to get out of these patterns which you have in your head. Yeah, I think that's something not only important for women, but also for men to kind of overcome these uh, patterns um, of self-enforcement. So getting out of the kind of roles uh, we see having the role models, as you mentioned also during your talk, uh, seems to be quite important. Yeah. Are there any further questions? 
Yeah, Julia, if you if you see the movie or if you see read the book, I would be it would be great for me to hear how you liked it. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I didn't know this one. Yeah. Okay. I might just say that I really love the movie. I've already seen it, but I will delve into the book as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and for instance, I mean, this book is really a horizon. When we, we, we had a women's network at RBI and we bought the book and gave it to all of the seven male um, board members. Yeah. So yeah, you have to find all kinds of channels to diffuse the knowledge. Yeah, thanks uh, for sharing your knowledge and also thanks, uh, Julia, for the uh, recommendation. Um, I think this is something um, all young economists, in particular female young economists, should know about. Um, yeah, and this is um, quite important discussion which we started here today. Um, in line with today's discussion, I would uh, kind of like to um, draw attention to an upcoming FIW seminar in international economics on gender differences in mobility after childbirth and the implication for the gender gap in employment by Andreas Albanes from the Luxembourg Institute of Socioeconomics Research, which uh, was postponed to May 12th, which actually deals also with one of these uh, topics we discussed briefly today. So uh, thanks, Birgit Niesner, for rising um, up this topic. Um, and there's another question by Harald Oberhofer. Um, he would like to follow up on the child penalty issues. Um, do you think increasing fathers' leave entitlements are sufficient to fully address this problem? What about early child care facilities? And Austria is also not performing particularly well in this. Point completely taken. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 the two measures for me. Yeah, that I mean, child raising facilities, as far as I know from younger parents right now, is 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 okay in Vienna and is really a big baustelle. It's a big construction site out of Vienna. Yeah, so this is definitely something um, where more infrastructure is needed. Um, on the other hand, it's something also, this, this division of labor between men and women is something also which, which extends beyond the times where you have, where you can put your child in the kindergarten. I, I, I remember one thing when I, when my kids were, were small, there was a lovely kinder kino, yeah? So it was something for three year olds where they were um, reading out um, uh, um, books with pictures and per, they had percussion and a narrator and it was wonderful and it was Saturday afternoon and and only women were there with their kids um, and I, I was asking myself where, where are the men if, if you assume that at this age more men uh, work and more mothers take a maternity leave yeah it was astonishing that even Saturday afternoon the picture was the pattern was like this so I think it's every measure and it has to be combined. Yeah, that's, um, I think, quite important to combine as many uh, different policy measures to really succeed in promoting women in economics. Yeah, and I wish good luck to all the young economists here. Yeah, taking the men on board is mm -hmm. one uh, quite important um, thing, not just with childcare facilities. Yeah. Um, do you have further recommendation for the young economists here today? No, I mean, I, I, I always discuss and, and if you come up um, and approach me to this. Yeah, I always discuss, I always enjoy discussions with where you see the obstacles, as I can see. Yeah. And, and, and the last recommendation for today, but then it's really enough is that, I mean, when my personal feeling is that when I had 
done my first uh, professional years and then I had kids was very often this feeling that you have you think you will not make it yeah that is too much the two things yeah? that um, you're afraid what happens if you get stress in your job and the child falls sick and all this and this is something which sometimes is an insurmountable you think it's too big the challenge yeah and this is something where as an older woman I can think in the end it always worked out in the end there was always a helping hand yeah build your build your network yeah um, but I'm I think that I mean of course family is something very individual but if you decide to have kids build your network and you will find ways if you also take your your husband on board to make things work out that's a quite important message. Uh, take kind of, you will find your way, then you will make it. That's a quite important message everyone should take away um, today. Okay. Thank Any you. further questions from the audience? Not, then I would really would like to thank you for your inspiring talk again. Um, and encourage everyone to here today to really try to make it and make the best out of it. And yeah, thanks to all the speakers today. Thanks to all participants um, for the interesting discussions. Thank you very much for the very interesting inputs in the keynote today. And we hope to see you soon. Um, at other FIW events. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.